Amen. Amen. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're looking at the parables of Jesus tonight. Uh, we, we've been in the parables and now we are uh, we're moving right along. Luke 7 verse 41. Luke 7, verse 41. So what, let, me, let me set the background of this parable. Now let me remind you, the Lord here, he has, he has a heavenly truth that he's trying to teach us. Uh, and so uh, he, in turn, in wanting to teach us this heavenly truth, he tells an earthly story so we can... So we can kind of start putting some things together. And the background of what we're going to read, I should have read it tonight, but for sake of time I didn't. Uh, but uh, the background is, is that there was a Pharisee who decided he was going to have Jesus over for supper one night. Uh, now keep in mind who the Pharisees are. Uh, the Pharisees, uh, they are all about religion and its rules. They are all about doing this and doing that and doing this, and doing that, and if you don't do this, then you're not right with God, and if you do that, you're not right with God, and, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and so they had many traditions of men, and many rules that they, had, that they followed, and if you didn't follow those rules, or you didn't conform to what they thought you should be, uh, then uh, you were just not one of God's. And so uh, the Pharisee, he brings Jesus to his house for a meal. And when, while Jesus is there, and, and what I'm about to tell you, don't confuse it with Mary who anointed the feet of Jesus, but while he's there, a woman comes in with an alabaster box, and she anoints the feet of Jesus, and she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. Uh, and the disciple, or not the disciple, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the Pharisee, remember he's legalistic. Uh, he's all about rules and do this and all that. So he's sitting there watching, and he says to himself, well, if this man is a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that is. If this man was who he says he is, uh, then he would know who she is and where she's been, and he would not let a woman like that be anointing his feet with an alabaster box full uh, of costly ointment. Uh, and so the Bible says uh, the man thought this inside of himself, and Jesus looks at this man and, he, and answers this man. So the Pharisee is thinking these things. He does not speak them, but the Lord knows our thoughts and he knows our heart. And so he looks at the man and the Bible says he answered the man and says, I've got something to say to you. Now, can you imagine that setting? You're sitting there thinking these not so good thoughts. You're sitting there thinking, well, if he's really a prophet. If he's really a prophet, if he really can see things that nobody else can see, then why can he not see this woman is a sinful woman? Why can he not see this woman has a sinful past and shouldn't be anointing his feet? And so the Lord, right out of the gate, proves that he is a prophet because he answers the man's thoughts. He says, I've got to say something to you. And so that's where we pick up uh, in this text. So Luke 7, beginning in verse 41... Uh, and the Bible says this, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? And that's what we're talking about tonight is little love, great love. Little love, great love. So he says, which, uh, which of those are going to love me the most? And Simon answered and said, this is not Simon Peter, this is Simon a Pharisee. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. Uh, and, said, and he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Simon, you see this woman? Now three times notice Jesus says this woman. It's as if there's an emphasis on this woman. So Jesus says, Simon, you see this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet, 
But she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman, he says again, has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that said it meet with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Go uh, in peace. And so may God add the blessings to the reading his word. Little love, great love is what we're looking at right here tonight. Uh, So a couple of things. Uh, This is the first of three parables uh, where Jesus speaks on forgiveness. So three of his parables out of some, I think there's around 40 some parables, uh, three of his parables deal uh, particularly with the issue of forgiveness. This is the first uh, of those parables. This is the first of two times... Uh, that the Lord uh, is anointed. The other comes a little bit later after this, uh, and it's Mary anointing the feet uh, of Jesus. Uh, But also, uh, this is the only parable given at a meal. Now, there's something interesting I've mentioned before. Uh, There's something very, very interesting about our Lord's, and I'm going to say it like this, our Lord's table talk. Uh, Because often in the Gospels, we see Jesus having a meal with disciples or... In the case of Zacchaeus, he, he's going home with sinners and having, having meals because he was a friend of sinners. And you and I both can say, thank God that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Um, uh, but uh, often we see him teaching and preaching and fellowshipping around a table, table talk. And that's one of the reasons I stress, uh, uh, I stress in my preaching, maybe not enough in recent days, but uh, there's something very, very powerful about having a meal around the table. We've stopped doing that. When we look back to generations before us and we try to analyze and figure out what separated them from us, like why were they so different? Why were they so blessed? Why did God have so much favor on them? Uh, and, And we look at who we are today and we look at the world around us, but one of the things we don't do anymore, we don't eat meals around the table. Uh, uh, we just don't do that. We're grabbing a meal through the drive through I mean, one kid's got piano, one kid's got softball, one kid's got dance. Uh, it's all at the same time. One kid's after school for this. One kid's got to go back to school after this. And so we have so busied ourselves uh, that there's no table talk. Uh, and I, I want to tell you, I can testify of this. I knew the power of this in Scripture. Jesus, and I, I didn't mean to go here tonight, but give me just a moment. Jesus emphasized the power of table talk. Like he chose meals to sit down with people he loved. Uh, Even after the crucifixion and resurrection, what did he do? He told them, he said, go to Galilee, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you on the shore. And when they showed up, you know the story of, of all of that. But when they show up, what has he done? He's fixed a meal for them. And so there's power in sitting around uh, eating together. Uh, that's, that was the manner of Jesus. And, and I believe that's, there's power in that today for your family and for our family units today uh, is, is table talk. And so, uh, and oftentimes it's, I've been in so many homes where there's been a meal, uh, but uh, some people's eating right here and some people's eating there, other people sitting in front of a TV with it on. Uh, but listen, TV off. And here's, let me meddle just a minute if I can. Cell phones down. I don't know who among us suddenly thought that we're all brain surgeons on call to perform emergency surgery on somebody's brain, but it's like everybody in the world is so glued to their cell phone that every time it goes off, they have to stop and answer it because they think they're a brain surgeon on call to go do brain surgery on the President of the United States, who very well needs brain surgery, but that's a whole other subject. So... But no, we're, listen, as far as I know, none of us are that important. And my philosophy is my secretary, my voicemail. My voicemail is my secretary. It'll pick it up. Well, what if somebody's died? Well, they'll still be dead when I finish my family meal uh, 30 minutes later. Uh, and so lay the cell phones down and have some table time because the Bible says there's power in table talk and in this time around the table. And I will tell you this. 
Um, I think a lot about my girls and where they're at and all they're doing for the Lord and stuff like that. And, and I try to go back and see what God did in their life to, to bring them where they're at today. Um, and I know very clearly it's, it was not me that made them who they are. And, and God knows me better than you know me, and you just need to take my word on that. They're, they're not who they are today because of me. Uh, but I do know for sure one of the things God used in their life was the TV went off and there was a meal served at a table. And we all sit down around that table and we sit there and we eat. And we did do devotion at the table. And we did talk about things at the table. We talked about issues of life. Uh, and uh, most parents today, even within the church, really has no clue what's going on in the life of their children. Because it's just grab a child and run here, run there, do this, do that. Uh, and seldom spend any quality one-on-one -on -one time with them. I, I, want, I want to say this. And this was not where we were going at all, so I'll just give you the devotion here in a minute. Uh, but uh, there is nothing in this world more worth your time than your children. Okay, I don't care what you think you got going on important. I'm telling you, everything else can wait. Everything else can be laid to the side for 30 minutes because the most important thing in the world is your children and your relationship with them and their relationship with the Lord. Well, guess how they're going to get to the Lord? They're going to get to the Lord because you point them that way. Uh, and, and how do you do that if you're not with them in any quality time? I'm going to throw one more out there as long as I'm meddling. Can I go with it? Sitting in the stands is not quality time with your children. And I don't mean anything bad by that. I'm all about sports. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm all about you know, your kids being involved here and there, but I'm just saying that's not quality time with your kids. If your kids are playing sports, you ought to be there. You ought to be in the stands, but that's not quality time. And so Jesus gives the example of table talk. Uh, and so we see this here. Uh, and uh, we see this in this text where he's having table talk. But this, but this is uh, the only parable that he gives sitting at the table. Now, he did a lot of teaching, a lot of preaching at the table, and a whole lot of fellowship and loving. Uh, but this is the actual only parable uh, that's given. So let's talk about this parable. So what he says is this. So there's two men that owes a debt to the bank. One of them owes... We'll just say $50, and the other owes $500. Uh, and when it comes time to pay that debt, neither one of them can pay the debt. Uh, and so Jesus said, who, who loves, or uh, he says, uh, who's more thankful for the debt that's been settled? Uh, and uh, the Pharisee himself says, well, the, the person that has been forgiven of the $500 debt, he's more thankful because he owed the most. Uh, and so that's the way Jesus begins talking about this woman who's anointing his feet. So, and really what you're going to see is it, well, it's not the question, excuse me, it's not the question uh, of the amount uh, of the debt or the amount, let's just say the sin, uh, but it's uh, the question of the awareness of the sin, because listen between this woman and the Pharisee. Listen to the, the contrast. So what you need to know is, is when in the parable, both people were debtors, period. One owed 50, one owed $500, but both were debtors. And so this Pharisee and this woman, this Pharisee, he obeyed all these rules, these do's and don'ts. Like he, he knew how to dress on Sunday, he tithed on Sunday, he knew when to stand for amazing grace, he knew when to sit down, he knew when to stand during the invitation, he knew how to pray when called upon. Like, like this man, uh, this man, he, he knew everything right, but he was still a sinner and he didn't see that because he did everything right. This woman, her life was a train wreck, uh, but she knew that she was a sinner. And you see that by the way she approached Jesus and she began to anoint the feet of our Lord. Took an alabaster box with costly ointment, a year's salary in this alabaster box and broke the box and began to anoint the feet of Jesus with that ointment that cost her a year's salary. So anyway, both were sinners. And so the Pharisee, we see that he has the sins of the Spirit, mainly pride. Mainly pride by thinking he is something because he keeps all of these rules. And let me say here, and let me throw this in there, let me remind you that one of the thing, things the Lord dispelled when he came and as he taught and did miracles is, is that, is that God is not a God of rules. A relationship with him is not about rules. 
Yes, there's the Ten Commandments. What about the Ten Commandments? Well, the Ten Commandments are there to show you and I that we can't keep them, that we're sinners and we need a Savior. That's what they're there for. Uh, and so uh, he, there, he's not a God that's about rules. He's a God that is about relationship. And that's what Jesus come to show. And he came to show the Pharisees. And he came, to show, he came to show the religious establishment. He said, listen, it's not about rules. It's about a relationship with me. And so this Pharisee, he did everything right, but he was guilty and he was a sinner and he was guilty of sins of the Spirit, mainly pride because he thought he was something. This woman, uh, she was guilty of sins of the flesh. This Pharisee, uh, well, his sins were hidden because nobody but God knew his sins. Uh, His sins were hidden because they were sins on the inside. This woman, unfortunately for her, her sins were public and everybody knew what kind of woman she was. Uh, But but at the end of the day, what we need to see uh, is we need to see that they were both sinners. And in this parable, listen, what we see is this. In this parable, one man owed 50, one man owed 500. What we see in this parable is they were both bankrupt and could not pay their debt. And so... Jesus is teaching us about being sinners, that every one of us is bankrupt and cannot pay our debt. What is that debt? That's our debt of sin and our debt of unbelief. Whether you're a a preacher, a deacon, a gospel music singer, a missionary, uh, or you're a drunkard, a drug addict, or a harlot on the street, we are all sinners and we are all bankrupt and none of us can pay that debt that we owe, our sin debt. But... Thanks be unto God through Christ Jesus. We don't have to pay that debt, not none of us, because Jesus paid the debt for us. He died for our sins. In fact, the Bible says, He who knew no sin, which was Jesus, He became sin for us, uh, that we might become the sons of God, that we might know the righteousness of God uh, through Him. Uh, And so uh, they were both sinners and they were both bankrupt, uh, and they both could not uh, pay their debt. Uh, and so Jesus is teaching this parable here. It's not so much about the amount of sin, but he's teaching about the awareness of our sin. So watch this. So we see three things found in this parable. We see repentance, uh, we see forgiveness, uh, and then we see affection. We see repentance from sin. This woman, she had repented from her sin and repented of her sin. Uh, And this Pharisee, he had not done that. And we know he had not done that because he was still so judgmental. If this man was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that is who's touching him. He would not let that woman in this house and would not let this woman touch him if he knew what kind of man. So he was so Uh, self-righteous. But this woman, she knew repentance. She had repented of her sins. And in turn, uh, she experienced forgiveness from God. And see, that Pharisee, he had not yet experienced forgiveness from God. That's why he was so critical and so condemning. Because his guilt weighed on him, but he tried to blame shift and he tried to put it on everybody else. So she knew forgiveness, she knew repentance, and because of repentance, she experienced forgiveness from God. And because of the forgiveness from God, she then had affection for Christ. And so that's why Jesus said, Which one of these two, the one that's been forgiven or a little, loves the most? And the man said, well, the one that's been forgiven the most loves the most. And the Lord said, yeah, that's right. This woman here, she's been forgiven of so much. And because she has been forgiven of so much, she demonstrated a life of repentance. She's been forgiven of so much. And because she's been forgiven of so much, she has great affection toward me as her Lord and as her Savior. And friend, I think about how true that is. People who, uh, people who realize that, hey, I'm a sinner. I'm bankrupt before God. I did not save myself. Uh, God saved me despite of who I am and in spite of who I am. And because he saved me, I am so eternally grateful to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, it, and it's so true that you'll see people that have the most affection for the Lord are people who have been forgiven so much and, and who have, uh, and who walk so humbly with the Lord. I, I talked to someone here the other day, just a, 
and I can't really, I can't take the time to describe to you how true and sincere this individual is in serving the Lord. But an aged saint, so, so humble and meek, uh, and just absolutely as close to the Lord as you could ever imagine anybody being closer to the Lord. I mean, this, this saint is so close to the Lord. And, uh, and they made this statement to me because I was bragging on them and letting them know, look, I'm proud of what you're doing for Jesus. Uh, he's using you right now. And they said, do not ever brag on me. And they said, because I am full of faults and I am the biggest sinner in this county. And so don't ever brag on me. And I just thought, that's such humility. And it was not a fake humility. It was very true humility because this individual, probably closer than any of us here tonight to the Lord, just humble and meek and mild and serving the Lord every single day in obvious service uh, to the Lord, but yet uh, inside of their heart. They said, don't brag on me because I'm the biggest sinner around here. I'm so full of faults and so full of, uh, so full of, uh, of sin. But, so, and that's why we see the Bible. The Bible says where grace, or I'm sorry, the Bible says where sin did abound, grace much more abound. And so you're going to see some people who, uh, who absolutely, they love to worship the Lord. And they are excited about King Jesus in their life. And they're excited about all that God is doing. And, and the reason there's such excitement and such affection is there's because they know, they have an awareness. Maybe they've been forgiven of a lot. But the thing is, they have an awareness of sin in their life. And they are so grateful that God would save them. Uh, I, I read the diary of uh, David Brainerd. He was the the grandson or the grandson-in-law of the great Jonathan Edwards who preached that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You need to go read that sermon where, where a great revival started as he preached this sermon. And he preached about a sinner uh, being out on a, on a, just basically a rope that is rotten, swinging out over hell. And, uh, that, you know, that that sinner better do something uh, because the sinner's in the hands of an angry God. But it, his, son, his grandson or grandson-in-law, David Brainer, and this is in the, mid, the late 1700s, he was a missionary to uh, an Indian tribe, a Native American tribe uh, up in New York State somewhere, and I don't remember which tribe it was. But you read this diary, and here you see this man. He's suffering for the cause of Christ, and he's, he's having to go in and make peace with these Indians and then live with them and build relationships. And there's language barriers. There's physical barriers. He's enduring hard winters and stuff like that. Uh, but in his diary, though, you're, you see a man who is so in love with the Lord and so committed to the Lord, uh, and he wants to... He wants to give his life serving the Lord. And you see this as he's writing all this out in his diary. I mean, the depths of his commitment to Jesus, it puts all of us uh, to shame. But then there would be these places in his diary. I keep, this is the late 1700s. Keep this in mind. This is not, it's not 2023 where there's every kind of sin on every corner of the neighborhood that you could possibly ever want to commit or be part of or on the internet, or whatever the case may be. This is the 1700s. And there's places in his diary, and, he's, and he's, he's in a remote area with these Native American Indians. And there's places in his diary where he will just be broken. And he talks about what a sinner that he is, and how awful that he is, and how terrible that he is. And that he needs God to forgive him of being such a sinner. And he's so sorry for sinning against God. And he's begging God to forgive him and to use him to bring the gospel uh, to people who had never heard the gospel before. And, and I just read this and I was so amazed. I was like, but I've just been reading you right and pour your heart out about how much you love the Lord and you're giving your life to him, being a missionary to Indians. And, and, and every day your desire is to serve him and to please him. And How can you write that you're such a sin? I'll tell you how. Because he had an awareness of his sin. And he realized that all of us are sinners. Every single one of us. He realized that we are all bankrupt before God and we... All, and none of us have the ability to pay our sin debt. We're bankrupt. And he realized that. And because of that, because he knew he repented and he knew he had been forgiven, 
he had such great affection to the Lord. Boy, I'm going to say this. If we really understood God's forgiveness in our life, we would rejoice more than we rejoice. God knows me better than I know me, and he knows you better than you know you. But here's the thing. He knows everything about you. Uh, And I am sure, I am certain that there's not one person here who would want the Lord to display all of you on the screen behind me. And I mean all of you. I mean everything you've ever been, everything you've ever done, every motive that you've ever had, every thought you've ever had, every action that you ever did, every word you ever spoke. You would not want every one of those uh, placed on this screen behind me. And God knows all of that about you. And despite of all of that about you, God still loves you. And when you repent, He forgives you. And if you're one of His children, He's forgiven you. And He's cast your sin far as the east is uh, from the west, uh, that, you will rem- that he, re- he remembers that sin no more. That's how loving and how gracious and how kind the Lord is. He's cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. My goodness, if we all ever got a grip on God's forgiveness in our life, uh, we would rejoice more than we would rejoice. We worship. Uh, our, our worship would be different day to day, both corporately in a church and privately riding down the road when we really start thinking about, God, all you've forgiven me of. But here's the thing about forgiveness and pardon. Uh, It's only good if it's accepted. See, Christ died for all. For all. He died for everyone. But forgiveness is only available if we accept God's pardon. And God's pardon is this. He sent Jesus to die for us and rise again. He died for our sins. Suffered, bled, died, rose again. That's God's pardon. Christ is God's pardon. And a pardon is only good if you are willing to receive that pardon. And so, in 1830, there was a man named George Wilson. Uh, And George, he had been caught stealing mail in 1830. And in 1830, that was a federal crime that was a capital offense. You would be hanged for stealing mail. And so that was his sentence. He was to be hung. And an appeal went to uh, President Andrew Jackson. Uh, And Andrew Jackson pardoned uh, this man. He pardoned George Wilson. Well, George Wilson would not accept the pardon. He would not accept it. He would not take it. And so the case was appealed because people thought that because the president had pardoned this man, that this man had to take this pardon and accept it and be free of the death penalty. If he did not accept the pardon, he would die. And so they appealed it to Justice John Marshall. And what Justice John Marshall wrote is this. He said, a pardon is just a piece of paper. He said, it does not go into effect unless the person who is receiving the pardon accepts the pardon. If the pardon is not accepted, then it is no longer valid. And he said, therefore, uh, since Mr. Wilson declined the pardon, he must be hung. And so it is with God's forgiveness. God offers, based on our repentance, he offers his forgiveness into our lives and in our lives. But it's nothing but just a piece of paper unless we accept God's pardon, God's offer of salvation, his free offer to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us and make us whole. He sent His Son Jesus. He's done everything He needs to do. He's made a way. And so if we ask God to forgive us, He will forgive us. He will cleanse us. We will receive His forgiveness. And in turn, we ought to have so much affection toward Him. And we ought to be so thankful, so appreciative of all that He's done for us. One time we got a call uh, I was listening to the, the, my scanner in my patrol car and got a call. For, I heard the call go out to a fire department, our, our fire department, and the call was uh, there's a house on fire, there's an infant inside. And so uh, 
I roll up probably 20 seconds before the fire truck gets there. Uh, I run over to the house. The firemen are dragging hoses off the truck. Uh, and a lady had uh, her baby in a crib uh, in a room off the kitchen. And in the kitchen, she had put uh, some kind of meat on to, to, uh, to fry. And, uh, and she left the house, locked the doors uh, because her baby was in there, went to the neighbor's house and decided to smoke some recreational type weed. Uh, and the, the pan caught on fire because she lost track of time. And uh, it caught the kitchen on fire and the fire had, uh, uh, had died out when we got there, but it had used all the oxygen that was in the, the kitchen there. Uh, and so as soon as a fireman broke out of wind that, that just flashed over, the, all of that intense smoke got oxygen and the fire started again. Well, uh, I took my mag light. Back then we didn't have these little tactical light. We carried the big mag light, so I took my mag light and, and uh, cleared out the glass and jumped on over into the, that room and got the baby and brought the baby out and uh, give the baby. The baby was unharmed in every way. Give the baby to the mother. And the mother kept saying this. She just kept saying, thank you, sir. 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 And yeah, she was doing wrong, but she was so grateful for a life that was saved. And listen, that's the way we ought to be. We ought to never get over the fact that God saved us, and we ought to be like, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for forgiving a sinner like me. And you know what? We last, the last week's parable is a generation of gripers. And, and you know why I think people gripe and complain and growl so often and so much? Either number one, they've never genuinely been saved and forgiven of their sin. They are just a Pharisee. They are just, they've just went through the motions of being a good person, good Christian. Or number two, they've genuinely been saved. Uh, but they've lost their appreciation for the fact that God saved their soul, that he didn't have to, that he didn't have to save me, he didn't have to save you, but he wanted to because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So there's little love and there's great love. And he who's been forgiven of much is thankful much, but they also have an awareness of the fact they're a sinner, they're bankrupt without him, and he has forgiven them, and in turn they have so much affection for just being saved and thankful to God for being saved. I used to pastor a man, and uh, God had saved him uh, in, a, in his adult life, but that man could not be quiet about the fact that God saved him. Like you could guarantee if we were having church sometime during that service, maybe when I'm opening, maybe when the choir's singing, maybe when they're special singing, you could guarantee that that man was going to stand up and he was going to thank God for saving his soul. He never got over the fact that God saved his soul. And I want to tell you something. If God ever saves you, you'll never get over it. You'll never get over it. And may God do that within us as we experience his daily forgiveness. May we... Uh, have affection that is renewed day by day because we've been saved, born again, made new, made whole because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross.